Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that folds to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeying to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to be a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. <clears throat> And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Thank you. You may be seated. Those of you who have your bulletins, you may want to open them up. Uh, Inside, in the insert there, you'll see both the thought that I'll review, some notes for the uh, sermon, as well as just a scripture summary of what we just heard here. And as, as most of you know, I like to, uh, basically, how do I condense a scripture, whether it's long or short, into one sentence? What's the essence of what's going on with this? And as I was looking at this, this week, this is what I came up with. Oh, wrong way. I came up with the wrong direction. As a loving father of both the unrighteous and the self-righteous, God desires that everyone discovers our home is in him. And we never want to forget that. You know, when we're talking about home and even as we're looking at repentance and we're looking at being distanced from God, ultimately repentance is just about coming home to God. So as I was thinking about the sermon, I I, I wrote these these initial thoughts here. And that is, what is God's grace? That's what we're looking at this morning. And that's really what we're looking at here for Father's Day. We're looking at a father of two sons. And so we want to ask that question. What is God's grace? One definition is that grace is God's unmerited good favor. We are not worthy of his mercy, forgiveness, and kindness. Grace is a free gift given through Jesus' sacrificial death for us. We don't deserve it, and we can't earn it. God's grace undergirds and affects everything in our lives. However, do we really live like it's a reality? Do we turn back to God, or when we turn back to God after going our own way, we celebrate grace? 
But if we're living righteous lives and then cry, that's unfair when God blesses a sinner with equal or greater favor than he's giving us, we show that we're performance-based. Grace has nothing to do with fairness. It has to do with the infinite mercies of God. And that's what we're going to see this morning as we look at the father heart of God being demonstrated in the father of these two sons. Now, a little bit of background for those of you who have your Bibles, uh, electronic devices, however you look at the scripture. Uh, We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 11. And in chapter 15, we have Jesus tells three parables that have the same message. They're parables and also they're kind of metaphors as well. And they talk about rejoicing when something that has been lost has now been found or recovered and put back in its normal status at that point. First of all, in the first part of the chapter, you have the parable of the lost sheep, and that's where you have uh, the picture of the shepherd leaving the 99 who have not wandered off, leaving them and going in search of the one to bring him back. Because you know something? To be a lost sheep like that is to risk being killed and slaughtered by wild animals and attacked. And so he will leave the 99 to go for the one. And then when he finds that one, he comes back and he says, rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. And then likewise, the second parable is about a lost coin. And in this case here, it was a drachma. So it was, a, a, it was worth something. And in fact, with it looks like in this particular scenario where this woman says, I lost one of my coins, it was actually one of 10 coins that went on a specific kind of headdress that she would wear on her wedding. And so it was a prized kind of possession. And so to lose one of those coins mattered more than even just losing the value of the coin. And so she lights a lamp, she sweeps the place, she finally finds it. And her joy over that is not just, oh, you know, I I found my $20 bill or whatever it is that, uh, that she found. It's like it was the joy of recovering something of value, much more than just the monetary value of that coin. And she calls people to celebrate with her. And then finally, we have the parable we're looking at today, the, what has been referred to as the parable of the lost son or the wayward son or the uh, prodigal son. And we're going to actually look if that's really a good title for this anyway. But regardless, in this same thing, we're going to find you have something that's been lost and something that has been found, and it's worthy of celebration. And in all three of these parables, you have the terms lost and found and rejoice and celebrate occurring in all three. So when Jesus told these three parables at the same time, he was really trying to get across to people how important it is to save the lost, to go after the lost, to find the lost. And when you do, it's worthy of celebration. And that's what we want to do. That's the Father's heart. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Now, some of you may remember from Mother's Day, I had made mention uh, when I was preaching at the start that sometimes husbands will buy the worst present for their wives, something completely either useless or so useful that they would never, ever want it. And in this case here, uh, there was a story that was in the Houston Chronicle at one point, uh, a gentleman by the name of Jerry Maltz had given his wife an iron for Mother's Day. Well, Father's Day rolls around and it was payback time. She bought him an ironing board. (laughs) So it would be interesting to know, you know, wives, have you gotten any gifts for your husbands here for Father's Day? Uh, We might want to share some stories at some point. More importantly, though, as we're looking at this story, rebellion is present in it, as as you heard when we read the scripture. And it's actually rebellion by both boys. And we kind of miss that with the second son of just how rebellious and hard his heart as well, even though he's the righteous son. 
And there was a king who had suffered much because he had rebellious subjects and they were in war against him. But one day they surrendered. They laid down their arms and they threw themselves at his feet and they begged for mercy. The king pardoned them all. And one of his friends there, one of the courtiers with him said, Sire, did you not say that every rebel should die? Yes, the king replied, but I see no rebels here. The people had repented. They had turned back. They were no longer rebels. And that's how God sees us. Now, as we look at this parable, just to finish up the introduction here, we need desperately to hear this with first century Jewish ears, or we're going to miss at least half of the parable. This story is just full of cultural surprises and even offenses to the Jewish hearers. The people listening, the religious leaders, the sinners, and yes, the tax collectors too, they all would have been shocked and even appalled as Jesus unfolds the, uh, the events of this parable for them. And additionally, we need to recognize that this story is both parable and allegory. The father of the two sons, he represents God, our father in heaven. He's full of grace, and he actively seeks the lost, wanting them to just come back home to him. Now, the younger son, he represents those sinners and tax collectors who were welcomed and accepted by Jesus, even though they were rejected by the Pharisees and the rest of the religious establishment. And it was these tax collectors and, and sinners that Jesus loved to share fellowship with. And they were the ones that repented, just like the younger son. And then the older son, he, well, he actually represents the religious people, the leaders especially, but just those who are toeing the line, following the law, doing all that they think that God wants them to do. But at the same time, they're thinking, well, I'm earning my privilege with God. I'm earning my position in these sinners and tax collectors and all. Well, maybe God will, you know, find the mercy to save them, but I'm not really even going to care about them, and I'm not going to rejoice when they really turn. The religious authorities failed to have joy when the common people and the sinners repented and returned God to God. And so those are the that's the themes that are underlying this whole story as we look for the Father heart of God. And the great thing with anything with Scripture, like I did with the Mother's Day thing, it's more than just about mothers. It's more than just about women. And likewise, this is not just about fathers and about men. It's about all of us. Do we have the heart of God? So we look first at a wayward brother. There we go. And he said, this is Jesus said, starting out the parable, a certain man had two sons. Now, this parable is unique to Luke's gospel, Matthew, Mark, and John. Don't include this story. But I want you to note here, because we always refer to this, or almost always refer to this as the parable of the prodigal son. Well, this man has two sons, and he actually has problems with both sons. And the even, you know, it's bad exegesis. It's bad interpretation to just name this after one of the sons. And additionally, because both stories with both sons reflect the father's heart, a better title would be the parable of the forgiving father rather than the parable of the prodigal son. Because we want to watch and see what this father does, how he interacts with his sons, how he demonstrates his love for them, and how he extends grace to both of them far above and even beyond the cultural norms and expectations of that time. And the younger of them said to his father, forgive, uh, Father, give me the portion of goods that follows, that falls on to me. Then he divided to them his livelihood. You know, we're not told anything about the age of the sons or how much of an age gap is between them or anything else. But, you know, since the younger son here is single, he's probably in his late teens, early 20s in that culture. He wouldn't have been much older than that. Now, the Greek term for the father's livelihood, which really means his estate and his wealth, his assets, all that, is literally, in the Greek, it's 
the life. So the son is saying he wants his portion of what his father's life will leave him. In other words, the younger son's asking for that portion of the estate, the inheritance, before the father's even died. And one other thing we need to note right at the beginning here is that according to Jewish law in Deuteronomy 21, both law and custom, the firstborn son got a double portion and every other son after that got a single portion. So in this case here, because you've only got two sons, the older son gets two-thirds of dad's estate, the, other, the younger son gets one percent, uh, one-third. But this is where I was saying about we need to hear with first century Jewish ears. Because we need to recognize how offensive this request or demand by the son was. And it would be offensive even to the tax collectors and the sinners. This son is essentially saying, Pop, I wish you were dead. I just want my part of your estate, your life's work, and the material lessons that you've worked for. I don't want to have to wait until you die. I want my inheritance now. I wish you were dead. And also note, too, that the son doesn't say, please, or, any, or ask for it. He just demands. He just essentially says, gimme. And, you know, what he's really saying, and he's not saying it out loud, aside from I wish you were dead, is he's saying, I don't want you. I don't want your love. I don't want your kindness. I don't want your watchful care over me. I don't want a relationship with you. I just want your stuff. No strings attached. And so they would have heard it just like we heard it there. Shameless, despicable. How self-absorbed and selfish this young man is. And so in ancient Near East culture, this demand from the son would have been seen as gravely, gravely, disrespectful and deplorable. And the listeners probably would have acted, he said, what? What an ungrateful wretch. What a pitiful, pathetic, dishonorable excuse for a son he is. Don't give him a penny. Disinherit him now and send him packing. That's probably how they would have felt. And they probably would have even said to the father, he's rejecting you. You should reject him because that's really what it was. But here, the kindness and the gentleness and the love of the Father comes through, and despite the outrageousness of the request, the Father gives in to the younger son, and he divides his estate, and he gives the younger son his portion. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. You know, the son couldn't wait to get out of there, to get out of the family home. He just, a couple of days, he's got everything packed, and he's taken off, and he is not looking back. And you know, looking at this too, you know, note where he went to a far country. If you're going to embrace a life of sin, if you're going to leave home and everything that you were raised in, you probably want to get as far away as humanly possible. You want to go to a place where no one knows you or your family. You want to go to a place where no one expects anything from you, especially they don't expect anything good or moral or upright from you. And you certainly want to go to a place where no one's going to hold you accountable or where no one's going to be disappointed in you. So he goes to a far country. And I want you to remember too, because again, this is hearing it with Jewish ears. Jesus is a Jew. He is telling this parable to a Jewish audience. The father and the sons in this story are Jewish. So to go to a far country means that son is headed to Gentile areas, far away from Judea and far away from other Jews. And so in his pursuit of sin and pleasure, he heads for idol-worshiping heathen lands where anything goes. He leaves also all the blessings of God's covenant promises regarding the land and regarding the temple, regarding everything in the land of Judea. So essentially, he's leaving God. And as I was thinking about this and how do we even apply that, 
I was thinking about as an application is that we need to recognize what the enticement of sin does to our hearts. That enticement for sin, for pleasure, for self-fulfillment, it will lead us to reject everything that we have been taught to value. And it will cause us to reject everything that we know to be true. So don't fall for Satan's lies. You know, they lead, as we will see here, to shame and loss. And many times they even lead to death, both spiritual death and sometimes even physical death as well. And so the way we guard our hearts is to stay in relationship with the Father, not to run, and to be honest with the Father about what we're feeling, what we're desiring, and to submit ourselves rather than to exalt ourselves. And most of all, don't run away. Don't go to that far country where, where there is nothing but sin and licentiousness and every evil thing. So he goes, and he lives this unrestrained life. And see what it says here. He wasted, where also NIV says that he squandered his possessions with prodigal living. Another way of saying prodigal is really wasteful living. And in fact, the Greek word that is translated uh, prodigal or wasted, it means scattered, almost like you're scattering seed. And that's how they used to plant. They, they didn't dig little rows and put the seeds in it. They just sort of scattered on the land and then they would till whatever. So that's really what he's doing with his wealth. It's just going willy-nilly everywhere. He's just finding different ways to spend his money without any thought and without any plan of what he's going to do when the money runs out. And run out it did. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. You know, Proverbs 19.3 says, a person's own folly leads to their ruin. And the younger son actually finds this out really quickly. Without resources, he's now at the mercy of a severe famine that comes to the land, and he's far from home. And his situation goes from being on top of the world and doing whatever he wanted to desperation of how he's even going to live for another day. So he decides to get a job, and he went, and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, that far country. And, he sent to, and that citizen sent him to his fields to feed swine. And he, would, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Now remember, the son, he's in a faraway country. It's a Gentile country. And he thought that's where he wanted to be, far away from anyone who knew him, far away from another Jewish person, or even perhaps far away from God. But as R.C. Sproul said in his commentary, Jesus makes it clear that the son has now descended to the dregs of society. Hear this again with Jewish ears. In the rabbinic laws that governed employment, the occupation of swine herder was considered so debased that anyone working with swine was seen as being cursed. His work brought the prodigal son into daily contact with animals that the Old Testament had declared to be unclean. And that meant for the son, under Jewish law, he would not be permitted to observe the Sabbath day because he himself was unclean. He was forced for all practical purposes to renounce the practice of his faith, Judaism. And now his life was at the lowest point of dereliction that a Jew could reach. And then even worse than that, even though he's working, even though he's doing this despicable, unclean work, he's still not even making enough money to eat. He's hungry all the time. And you know, in a time of famine, the price of food, whatever is available, that skyrockets. So he's make, doing a minimum uh, earning job, and there's no way he can even really afford to feed himself. He's utterly alone. His good time friends are gone. He has no support system. And as it says, you know, he's all alone. Nobody gives him anything. No one around him cares if he lives or dies. And that's exactly kind of the situation he was wanting when he went out on his own. 
He's now at rock bottom and he can't get any lower. And, you know, this is an important thing to note because we tend to be driven by compassion a lot. So an application point here is if you see somebody really struggling, really looking like they're hitting rock bottom, especially if it's because of their poor choices, pray first before you do anything to help them. And the reason I say that, uh, I believe it was Pascal who had said at one point, you know, will I feed the poor? No, first I'm going to seek the kingdom of God, and then I'll feed the poor. Will I assist this person who is naked? No, first I'm going to seek the kingdom of God, and then I will assist him. And what he was saying there was that God may be doing a work in somebody. They may have to hit that worst of rock bottoms. And for those who work with Humble House, you've probably seen that as well. These ladies and, you know, their counterparts, men as well, they have addictions, they have other kinds of things, they have really, really poor life choices that have caused them to lose everything. And if you swoop in too soon and cushion the fall, you may actually short-circuit what God's wanting to do because God wants to allow them to come to that point that they turn only to him. Not to another person, not to a social service system, but to God alone. That's not saying we're not driven by compassion. That doesn't mean we don't help. That means we seek God first. Lord, do I extend my hand or don't I? What are you doing? Because I want to be your hands and feet. And sometimes to do the right thing, parents, you know this, Sometimes you have to let your child mess up because it's the only way they will learn. And then those lessons are of life-giving value at that point. So he's at his rock bottom, but he discovers hope. He's got a humbled viewpoint now rather than this arrogant viewpoint. And this is what happens. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. You know, the good thing about being at the bottom is that there is only one way to go, and there's only one way to look, and that's up. And so that's what this young man does. With all his delusions, with all his fanciful thinking that brought him down to the dust, he comes to himself now. And Keith Green, back in the 1970s, had written a song called Your Love Broke Through. And he captures this moment that the son's experiencing really, really well. In in part of the first verse, he says, Well, I've been blind all these wasted years, and I thought I was so wise. But then you took me by surprise. And it was like waking up from the longest dream. How real it seemed until your love broke through. I've been lost in a fantasy that blinded me until your love broke through. And that's what's happened here. God's love has broken through at his rock bottom. And the son continues with this new line of awareness. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So with this humbled outlook, this son no longer aspires for big things or flashy things or glittery things. He just wants the small things now. He would accept even being a hired hand of his dad's, a day laborer, if you will, for his father, just to have enough food and to have some quality of life. You know, he doesn't even aspire to be a son again. He doesn't hope that big. He knows he's shamed his father and himself. But maybe, just maybe, his father will have pity on him and demonstrate some level of mercy to him. And so he places all of his hopes in his father's love, compassion, and kindness. And William Barclay had noted that the son decided to come home and plead to be taken back, not as a son, but in the lowest rank of slaves, the hired servants, The men who were only day laborers, and this is the important part. The ordinary slave 
was in some sense a member of the family, but the hired servant could be dismissed at a day's notice. He was not one of the family at all. So the prodigal son is, is not even saying, make me a part of the lowest rung of the family. He's just saying, let me even be like a day laborer. That's better than what I am. I, 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 I choose the bottom rung, Lord. Father, just do that. And even that was enough for him in his humbled situation. But what we see here is a father's forgiveness, a father's heart. And he arose and he came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You know, we don't know how long his journey took him to get back, because remember, he was in a far country. And in his poverty and his hunger, without any money, without any resources, it could not have been an easy journey. You know, sometimes repentance is not an easy journey. And we may feel like we have nothing to pay to make the journey, but the journey of repentance still costs us everything because it requires us to lay down our lives, to lay down ourself, to come back to God and say, okay, God, you're the one that matters, not me. And you know, I wonder what kind of thoughts went through the son's mind as he was as he was journeying. Was it memories of times with his father? Memories of, of the times he had uh, dismissed and he devalued his father even before he left home. And that maybe you know, just thinking about those things left such an indelible mark on his heart that he was brought into appreciation and respect for his father. And maybe even a deeper sense of how much he had hurt his father by demanding his inheritance and by leaving home in rebellion. That's what repentance will do. But the amazing part here, and this again, this would be amazing to the Jewish listeners, is that his father is watching for his return. You know, his father's probably been looking longingly down the road many times a day and maybe wondering in the back of his mind, will today be the day. Will my son come back today? Will my son come back at all? Is he dead in some ditch, in some pauper's grave? Will I ever even see my beloved son again, even though he left in rebellion? But then note what it says. His father sees his son when he's still a great, while he's still a great, yeah, a great way off. You know, he sees him and somehow recognize him and recognizes him despite his dirty, torn clothes and disheveled appearance. But he sees him from a distance and he has compassion. And, you know, it's notable here, the younger son may have left his father's home, but he never left his father's heart. His father was still looking for him. And then compassion motivates the father's next actions. He runs down the road to his son, bridging that great distance between him and his son by his own effort. And once he gets there, he just hugs on his son, hugs and hugs, falls on his neck and kisses him. And once again here, the Jewish listeners would have just been in shock with a description of these actions because it's completely uh, opposed to any Jewish decorum or respect. As, as one commentary noted, this action breaks all Middle Eastern protocol. No father would greet a rebellious son this way. And in fact, in the ancient world, a man of this father's social stature would wear great robes and he'd be careful to follow all the customs and the protocol of the time. So to see such a man running down the dusty roads with his robes girded up at his waist, it was unthinkable. But this father didn't care who saw him, didn't care if anybody thought less of him. He just wanted to get to his son. And when he does, he falls on his neck and kisses him. And in the ancient Near East, to kiss someone this way is not merely a sign of affection or even of recognition, but it's also a sign of forgiveness. By his running to the son, by him kissing him, He's already saying, son, you're forgiven. And the son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. 
and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Well, despite this father's overwhelming greeting, the son still has repentance in his heart, and he still wants to express that to his father, uh, that he's sinned both against God and his father. He's recognizing that, and he recognizes his complete unworthiness to ask for anything. But you know what happens here is the father doesn't even give him a chance to finish his rehearsed speech. The father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. The father cuts his speech off right in the middle. And instead of speaking directly to his sons, he turns to his servants who have probably run up behind him. And then he gives these directions. Get the best robe and put it on him. Get a ring for his hand and sandals on his feet. And each of these things that he directs his servants to do have much more significance than just improving his son's disheveled appearance. First of all, there's the best robe. This would be a ceremonial robe, the best room. It was a robe. It was a mark of honor. You know, when a king sought to honor a visiting dignitary, he would present him with a costly robe. So the father's command carried this implication, treat this son of mine as the guest of honor in my house. <coughs> and then there's the ring. It's obviously a signet ring. And when it was given from father to son or from king to a prime minister or anything like that, it signified granting or transferring authority from the king or the father to the son or to the servant. And so this young man who says he isn't worthy to be called a son, all he asks is about is becoming a servant, the father, by calling for the ring to be put on his finger, is restoring him to the authority that he had as a son in his father's house. And then there's the third commandment as well. Sandals for his feet. Shoes and sandals were a luxury. They were worn by free men, never by slaves. So this young man had appeared at his father's house <coughs> in bare feet, looking like, a sl looking like a slave. But the father ordered that shoes be put on his feet. In doing all this, the father is restoring his son to its position that in pride and sin he walked away from. And now the son has returned in repentance and humility and the father is restoring him. And how much like God does with us when we repent and we turn to him. Scripture says that we're now a kingdom of priests and that we are the adopted children of the king of all the universe. That's restoration, despite our sin. One, you know, Lincoln once was asked how he was going to retreat the rebellious Southerners once they had finally been defeated and had returned to the Union of the United States. The person who asked Lincoln that question, what are you going to do, really thought Lincoln was going to express thoughts of vengeance. But Lincoln said, I will treat them as if they had never been away. And in one of his speeches, he had even said, with malice toward none. Lincoln had a big heart. He had father's heart to forgive and to receive back like they had not even rebelled or gone away. And it's that wonder of love that God bestows to us. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to be merry. You know, meat wasn't e eaten frequently. They primarily fish or vegetables and grains and that kind of stuff. So to kill the fatted calf, which was reserved for very, very special occasions, feast days, things like that, uh, it, it is to throw the largest party and feast for his son that he possibly could do. And, you know, we're not told the younger son's reaction. In fact, we really don't hear anything more about the younger son after he just turns up on his dad's doorstep. But I would imagine he's just looking around dumbfounded at his father's great mercy, barely daring to believe that his father could so forgive him 
and so welcome the hem back. But there is a fly in the ointment, so to speak. You have a self-righteous brother. And his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. The older brother hears the... Uh, I'm sorry. The older brother, he's been out working hard all day in the field. He's been doing what his dad wants him to do. And he comes home in the evening after working hard, and he hears all this commotion and celebration, and then he finds out what's happening. The servant said to him, Your brother is coming because he's received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. Now, once the older brother hears about the younger brother's return and his father's over-the-top reaction about him coming back, you know, you can't help but wonder for a moment what's going through his brain that, gir that, that girds his anger, that pushes him to such an angry response. You know, does he remember his father's sadness when the son, the younger son, left? Did he recall how many times his father had said, oh, I wonder what happened to my son? We haven't heard anything from him. I wonder if he's even still alive. Did he call to mind all the times he saw his father looking wistfully down the road, hoping that someday his prodigal younger child would return. We don't know. But look at the older brother's reaction. But he was angry and would not go in, go into the party. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Notice this next unexpected event. More shock value to the audience that's listening. His father who again, you know, in that culture, sons would go to the fathers, not vice versa. The son comes out of the party to plead with his older son to come in and join the celebration and to be happy that his brother has returned safely. And so once again, the father now, he's demonstrating his heart for both his children. Now he's chasing after the older son, the self-righteous son. And you know, in that culture, really what should have happened is if his older son had any kind of disagreement or challenge for his father, he should have been the one to go in to him and talk to him and say, Dad, can I talk to you? Rather than just, I'm not going in and, you know, basically leaving it that the father needed to come out to talk to him. And here's a great irony in this parable. The brother who has been on the outside, in other words, the prodigal son, he's now on the inside. And the brother who had been in the inside of his father's favor all this time, now he's the one choosing to be on the outside. Their roles and their positions are reversed in the story. And so the son, the older son, answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you, gave me, you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. You know, this older brother's complaint comes down to about three words, just like a two or three-year-old whose toy has just been grabbed by another child and is playing with it. It's not fair. We've heard that before, right? You know, Dad, you're not being fair. You never demonstrated any actions like this toward me, and I've never opposed you at any time. And then he goes on. But as soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed a fatted calf for him. You know, the older son, he's so angry that he d disavows his own brother, and he says, this son of yours. And then he accuses the father of inequity. This brother who left the family in the most despicable way and wasted all the family inheritance in, quest highly, quest in question highly questionable and immoral ways, you know, to welcome him back in such a generous way was beyond understanding. And what troubled the father here is that his son is failing to have any joy about the younger son's return. And that's what this is all about. The father has joy that the, fa that the son has returned. This older brother, he's so consumed with concerns about performance and external righteousness and with issues of justice and equity that he doesn't allow himself to join in, in the joy and the celebration of the moment. And I can tell you, self-righteousness will rob you of joy. It will rob you of pleasure because you're just a bean counter 
checking that scale to make sure that you're getting everything that you're supposed to be getting. Because he lacks his father's love for his son, for his brother, he also misses out on the joy too. But here the father gives his older son a reality check, and with this we'll be fi finishing up. And he said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. So he reassures, first and foremost, he reassures his son, his older son, of his love and the closeness of their relationship. Son, you're always with me. Now, what's even more important is, in the Greek, he didn't actually say son. He called him child. And in the Greek, in this, in this specific word, child is a word of the most tender affection. It's a term of endearment. So he's not just saying son. He's like saying child, my child. This is why it matters. You matter. You and I, nothing can ruin our relationship. I love you, and I want to reassure you on this. And then he reminds his son, all I have is yours. You know, the younger son may have returned. The younger son may have re been received with feasting and rejoicing and honor. The younger son is still a son. But the younger son has already received his inheritance, and he's made foolish cho choices with it, losing it all, and now everything that the father has belongs to the old elder son, if only he'll recognize it. And you know, one of the wonderful things here is that when God gives good gifts, like this father gave this good gift to his younger son of celebrating him and bringing him back and throwing the party, it doesn't impoverish God the smallest amount. And it doesn't take away from anything that God intends to give us. And that's the portrait here. And then the father says, it was right that we should make Mary and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Finally, the father gives his perspective to the older son. Celebrating the younger son's repentance and return, that is his very salvation at this point, is a cause to celebrate and make merry. Because the son has literally crossed over from spiritual death to spiritual life. And in the grand scheme of things, what is a party and a fatted calf to the salvation of a soul, to the rescue of a person? And then Jesus does an amazing thing at the end here. He leaves the story hanging. He doesn't tell us what the older son decided. Will you go in to the party? Or are you going to stay out here with your arms folded, maybe stamping your foot in anger? Are you going to stay there in your pride? Or are you going to be humbled in like manner as your younger brother chose to allow his humiliating experiences to humble him? And so even here, the question for us at the end is, do we see ourselves as the elder son? And if we do, you know, are, are we doing the right things for God? Are we not straying? But at the same time, is maybe resentment building in our hearts and maybe we're being bean counters of, you know, how many righteous acts we're doing. Are we somehow as I asked at the very beginning, are we really getting the message of grace that it has nothing to do with equity? It has everything to do with the mercies of God. And so as we look again at the summary of this passage in one sentence, as a loving father of both the unrighteous and the self-righteous, God desires that everyone discovers, each one of us discovers that our home is in him. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you demonstrate a good father's heart to us. Lord, for those here in the church or those watching online who did not have good earthly fathers, you are the contrast to that. Lord, for those who have had good fathers, you are the epitome and the model of what it means to be a good father. 
Lord, we want to be touched by your love. We want to receive it. And Lord, likewise, we want to model how you see us, how you feel about us, that in fact, you do rejoice and all heaven rejoices when one sinner comes home, when one sinner repents. And likewise, you celebrate and have joy in your heart for all those who have not strayed. It's not about fairness. It's about your grace and your mercy and your kindness and your love. And so, Lord, may we, on this Father's Day, go forth from here evidencing your Father's heart for the world and for each other. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.